Welcome everybody. My name is Toby McLeod and I'm in Berkeley, California. And we have uh, Dr. Wolda Tedessa with us from Oxford, England, who will be speaking in a couple minutes after I get some introductions out of the way. And also Dr. Kenneth Wilson is joining us from Borneo, who Tedessa and I both know from our years uh, when Ken was the executive director of the Christensen Fund, where Tadessa was a program officer. So um, we've been streaming the uh, four films from the Standing on Sacred Ground series for the last three weeks. And my protocol as a filmmaker and an ally to different indigenous communities is to try to facilitate conversation that involves the people from the communities that we film in. So it's, it's about the communities, it's not about the filmmaker or the films. So we've just had three films uh, in the last three weeks. The first film took us to the Altai Republic in Siberia, in Russia, and also to the Winnemum Wintu in Mount Shasta here in California. Uh, where communities are fighting against huge government projects that threaten their traditional lands and sacred sites. The second hour, which we showed last week, uh, was about the tar sands of Canada and the community of Bozeman on the Ramu River in uh, Papua New Guinea. Both of those indigenous communities are fighting against mining uh, that's contaminating their rivers and affecting health and sacred lands as well. And it the end of each of those weeks, uh, the first week we had uh, Winnemum Wintu Chief Colleen Sisk with us for an hour. And last week we had Anishinaabe activist Winona LaDuke. And we have just posted both of those hours on uh, YouTube. Uh, so anybody who missed those conversations, which were really wonderful, can also catch up and go back and look at our YouTube recordings. Um, so it's been really an amazing honor for me over all these years to work with people like Tadessa and Ken and to try to convey these really complicated, important stories of traditional people preserving land and some ceremony and language and food sovereignty uh, and in an attempt to maintain traditional culture. And Tadessa, without you, we never would have had the access in the Gamo Highlands that we had. You had sent the word that we were coming and that maybe we could be trusted to tell the story in a good way. And um, we were really welcomed with open arms. The, the, the Gamo Highland story in this third hour of, of Standing on Sacred Ground, which I hope many of you have had a chance to watch, is paired with the uh, Queros in Peru. Perhaps the most suspicious, uh, least trusting, uh, and really smart people to not really trust the outsiders coming in and trying to uh, offer to tell their story, but when the when the people of the Queros welcomed people from the Gamo Highlands there at the Potato Park in, in Peru, we had a cross-cultural merging uh, that really linked those two stories in the, in the Fire and Ice film. And we also happened to film in each place an instance of the traditional people having trouble conducting their traditional ceremonies in the face of religious persecution uh, in both cases, um, in, in Peru from a Catholic uh, ceremony that was going on at the same time. And when we were in Gamo, uh, there was a conflict with a, with a sort of a fundamentalist Christian group. So we had the link of one of these very subtle threats that indigenous people often face, which is difficulty of maintaining cultural tradition in the face of mainstream religions uh, that, are, that are aggressive. So, um, Tadessa, I would love to uh, welcome you here. We'll hear from Ken a little later. Um, but Tadessa, I'd love to start with you maybe, maybe addressing the question of the meaning, how the film was received in the Gamo Highlands, whether it, it helped in any way, um, you know, how, it, how it has worked for you to fund and support other films and books and even the Festival of a Thousand Stars, maybe you could talk about how this film has had, had an impact and then how the rest of your work has had an effect on Gamo culture. Thank you, Toby, for the introduction. And it was uh, really nice to work with Ken and you um, in Ethiopia and the other places where we worked. And, um, 
it's such a a great feeling of also gratitude to everybody who helped then and also the satisfaction of the work done and your film um, really strongly complemented every other thing we did but gave pride to people in their cultural um, in their cultural identity by cultural identity I mean sacred sites in Gamo defined people so the behavior of every Gamo person when they walk through the landscape they speak with the land you can have that feeling people like Shagire, Mako, Mako Wario, Malevo, all the elders carry their staffs with a metal tip they're even scared to um, peg it onto the ground because they they should not as elders they should take care of the land but not peg it so it was so significant um, that film and it portrayed it, it gave confidence to young people mm -hmm. to really see themselves and their practices in the film and to say to 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 find themselves in the configuration of spiritual things they've been bombarded by other powerful religious institutions but did not have a chance to to speak about their own but they could see i think since then that was a turning point they started to talk about their practices proudly started wearing their costumes and because it was complemented with the festival that brought over 60 um, ethnic groups from southern Ethiopia, ethnic groups that did not occupy the center stage, the cultural and other political uh, center stage, simply because they were from that region, a region that was originally for slaving and for ivory poaching but to uh, until very recently that region was um i think until the uh the post-war period that was the situation in the south but it had improved a bit during emperor Haile Selassie, and then we went back to tyranny after that so that film and then the festival that was connected to it where we brought all the elders to give blessing to the young in that football pitch that had some 40 to 50,000 people. And the young people were roaring, saying amen to the blessing of elders and all the elders queuing up and following the, the thing of seniority. So the senior, the most senior blessed first and then the youngest and so on and it was an unseen before that and that kind of was i think the power behind uh, later developments and this was coupled again with uh, the festival was not only for blessing and music but it was also about food and other traditions so people came with their meals and tasted each one another's kind of thing uh, and then uh, brought the uh, drinks and introduced the dances and food and music to one another and they did it for three days and nights and this was another powerful thing that these were yeah. culture their culture could translate into a powerful uh, powerful um, dynamic to bring anything required and we had books law of local history i think and dictionaries and histories of central ethiopia and with compliments from local happenings of a given period and those also so so the seed of awareness about what about how they should view themselves and what they've gone through and what their future should look like so i think we've done um, a very complex thing 
but that complexity has helped me to see connections. They are complex people with you know complex agricultural systems, complex kind of layers of responsibilities to the to the earth, to people, to even in the prayers you could see they do not pray for the self, they pray for an elder reciting prayer would go the list of things he prays for, the bamboo, the barley, the insect seedlings, the uh, bees, the cows, and the womb of the woman to be fertile, etc., etc. So you just recite the list of things you want to thrive. And so I think um, the film and all the other things we've done, the film has been a strong element in bringing about a transformation of thinking and showing, making the, helping them think in the kind of future they want to, to take. Mm. They express their, you know, they were given the courage to speak about what they like, about their seeds, about their cows, about their animals, their trees, their costumes, their language, and their food above all. So it just locked them to their places um, in, in a very uh, interesting way. And um, now, yes, they, they, they find themselves in that kind of circumstance where they um, have woken up to the realities of the last 100 and something years. And they see themselves now as uh, people who need to steer their future towards their future. Not to, not to let others stay for them, but uh, take control of their future. That's so great to hear. Um, yeah. Makes me really happy. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit, before we get to what's happened since then, you, one of the things you taught me um, and, and really counseled me about was to be careful about focusing too intensely on a given sacred site you know, a specific place. And so I wonder if you could describe the Gamo conceptualization of the landscape as yeah, a... Yeah, it has taken me quite a long conversation with Shagire to learn, to learn this because uh, the young boy I was trained about, you know, a sacred site, the church, or, you know, or, or certain spots in it. But actually, many of our elders think that's not correct because they say, what is not sacred about the land? Hmm? What is not sacred about the land? You want to sit in someone's plot, that's sacred, because this is a place where you place the seed into the soil and you must keep it clean, clean in a sense, clean from all kinds of evil, including you don't lie there, you don't, speak things that are not right. You don't use abusive words. You don't make love on your plot, for example, or anybody's plot. You don't pollute the land. So, and um, the paths um, you use are sacred. So they connect places, your home and your fields and your secondary home in the mountain range. And paths are sacred because they, they bring diseases, they bring war, they also bring emissaries who bring you peace and, uh, you know, uh, people who mediate between conflicting groups. And there are paths that um, you take the dead body, the corp, you know, you carry the dead through and paths where you can, only the newlywed uh, can be, um, can take uh, to go through the landscape. And, and then you go walk to the market. There is no not secret space because the market is where you are recognized as a human person there in Gamo, as a Gamo. Because it's there where you and your bride have a small, say 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters, small piece of thing where your clan elder will show you that, that belongs to you, where you would sit at your bright kind of end of your bridal kind of room, your, your seclusion spirit who covered your hair with your butter and so on, which, which you very well portrayed in your, in your uh, film. 
of Dobo. Um, so everything I think is sacred. The land is very much revered and you are careful with what you do with the land. So the sanctity, some places it's easier to, to do certain things in some places. That makes them spots, sacred kind of. Otherwise, all land is sacred. And when you go, um, you carry some tobacco, you kind of offer the land some prayer and, and tobacco too. And you wish the past to take you safely to where you're going. And you bless and actually sacrifice to the, to the path that you've returned safe from a journey you've, you've, you've made. So it's, it's all a web of things and there's no free kind of thing. The river stream, the stream down in, the, in a valley is a place where you and the other community have taken oath, you know, for various reasons. And um, the, the big tree in the neighborhood is where something important has happened. Each activity makes the place sacred. So you always pay tributes to that uh, favor the land has done to you, safeguarding you or giving you food or being your eternal home when you die or for giving you children. So you are there with it and it's your partner. So you are in a mutual caring and guarding relationship. And it's that relationship that makes the land sacred, so also the human being. The human being is in that respect sacred and uh, deserving all kinds of respect from, from you and from everybody. One of the most beautiful feelings that I had in Gamo was the sense that people had been there forever. I mean, the, there was this connection to the place that was just so ancient. And I, as you were just speaking, I was thinking of America where everybody's so mobile and, you know, we don't have that connection to the tree and the, the market square and the, and the field where maybe our great, 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 great grandparents grew the same inset crop that you're, you know, you're, you're teaching your kids to grow. So there's something about that, that um, rootedness to the place that's so tangible and gamo that was just incredible to experience. Could you, could you tell us what's happened since the film? I know there's some hard times right now in Ethiopia, not just COVID-19. Could you, could you tell us about what's, what's been happening recently? Yeah, the, there have been waves of things that have happened. Uh, after so many years of very hard life, there was a kind of revolution that ended uh, becoming a, a reform at the end. But that at the close of, or at the beginning of, that reform, we thought everything would be easier for us too as people. But the first thing was that uh, some Gamo were victimized around Addis Ababa, uh, slaughtered and killed and very shocking thing developments took place. Mm. And it wasn't only around Addis Ababa, but also in the eastern province of Bali, there were many Gamma weavers living there, simply making clothes and providing, selling the communities there. Not rich, not anything, but itinerant weavers. Weave one season, go back home to do agriculture. So there was an, a kind of Islamic fatwa where the, it was decided, it was declared in the massive marketplace where there was large um, a number of people that no one should provide the gamo with anything, not sell, not buy anything from them, uh, exclude them as much as possible, not rent houses to them, not allow them to board transport facilities in that region. And then that would be extremely uh, punishable by, by the law of that specific place and mm. that specific group. So it was religious leaders who was passing this judgment. So then uh, this darkened our kind of hope to some extent. And then there was anger in Abaminch where young people wanted really to take revenge on an establishment of that region that had a branch, a bank in Abaminch. But then when they were trying to 
you know, destroy that place. Gamo elders, you know, Abaminch went with tufts of grass and then kneeled down asking, you know, holding the young people to stop. And they managed to stop without a single stone being thrown in that building and save the building. Mm -hmm. And that death and um, that symbolic move by the elders gave Gamo much renown than any time in their history. I didn't know that death could give you uh, recognition. Mm -hmm. You would get the recognition via death and uh, sacrifice. Um, I didn't know um, that stopping some violent thing would give you so much uh, applause and acknowledgement by the nation state. Since the Gamo have become, have been on many peacemaking tours in the country. Mm -hmm. So they were invited to the National Palace in Addis, to the palace grounds where they built, uh, where the new Prime Minister, uh, Abi, established a park um, uh, and opening the palace grounds for the public. And so they were called there and I think they appealed to the nation, which was in a bad shape that, at that moment because there was violence all over the place. So they really leaned down and kissed the ground and kissing the ground begged the country to to come to its senses and to really think deeply about their children and their grandchildren's moment rather than their own uh, selfish interests of being destructive and and um yeah disrupting other people's lives so mm -hmm. i think it helped a lot um um, I think the violence receded since, and uh, the country is in a much better shape now. Um, and uh, we're all grateful for the elders. And there were some incidents where I myself, myself took part when I went back, because I'm an elder, I joined a group um, that some young people had made a mistake of angering Konso young people in the football field. and. We thought this must be resolved, however small that incident might have been. So we went to Konso with our elders and then said, we're absolutely on the wrong. Our young people have uh, done such a mistake and we that we apologize and that would um, compensate for any loss. And um, yeah, and if necessary, <laughs> hand over the guys, with the children or the young people who made the mistake. So. So they really, the consul were so happy and they forgave and then our relations now with the consul are good. But after that, there was, and the second wave included, I think, um, um, some prior to the COVID, there was, and continues to be locust. And there's been a locust invasion and it's, it's um, still uh, going on. And we had um, landslides and rain, really, and flooding. Um, and this has been ongoing for the last few months. Huh. And um, a total of, I think, 14,078 families were affected by this. Uh, I heard from the administration. And 14,605 persons were displaced and lots of fields of crops, bananas and so on were destroyed. And it did not stop there. There was a cholera epidemic also in Southern Gamo, wow. which um, affected 80 people. And it was, um, I think the health officials or the health officers did, did good work and five were dead and we, we think it might uh, be under control, but um, it is not being cleared so far. But it has affected more the the Omo people, the sixteen uh, pastoralist groups. Mm. So, and and um, yeah, and this is the situation. And on top of this comes this terror of uh, COVID nineteen. And they estimate about 480,000 people would be affected by this. And the facilities they have are not really sufficient. Not even, I mean, sufficient is quite 
uh, kind of shows there is some abundance, but actually lacking. Mm. They have some structures of clinics and uh, hospitals, about five hospitals. And you can imagine um, a hospital in a place where um, there are no facilities. And um, yeah, they would require nearly all assistance possible mm. if we can help save some of the uh, 400 um, projected 480,000 victims. Wow. Will you be setting up some kind of a fundraising opportunity for people to help in Gamo that we could send the word out? I think that's um, our plan and we are, there's uh, a young uh, medical student in, in Dublin and uh, another guy in the US. So we're kind of creating a small hub from where we can probably launch a GoFundMe kind of campaign for which we would hope to raise some, some of this fund. And there, it's a ma big amount of money they need, but we'll try our best to do what we can. Some of the assistance may come from international organizations, but every country seems to be seeking assistance at the moment, including the bigger ones. So Good. Uh, we'll, we don't we'll know. And it, it's like a stone being thrown from Addis down to the south, you know, because of the, the speed would be falling. Uh, <laughs> the further you throw, the slower would be the thing well before it drops. Yeah. So any resource you send, uh, through the other channels would al always get thinner and thinner as it goes down to our region. So we are worried a bit and we are really concerned. And the implications of this are, are very serious. The uh, locust has wiped out leaves of trees and so on. You know what damage locusts can do. And then there's been the flooding and the excessive rain. Um, also affects your food, and it's it's not actually the um, moment where it should be like this. But we are faced with layers of problems and very hard to confront. Very hard to confront unless there is some support. But and the thing is, um, there is. You know, farmers are always strong and they've gone through various um, problems in the past. They've dealt with cholera, the typhoid, ty multiple kind of uh, things. But when all of them come together, that's where it becomes really hard. So we would really seek assistance to help them. Well, yeah. I'll definitely, um, when you get your GoFundMe campaign up, we'll definitely help by sending the word out to everybody who's listening now and everybody who's signed up and help. you know, we have a lot of Sacred Land Film Project people. Thank you very much, Toby. That's, that would be very, very helpful and people would be extremely grateful. I'm sorry to hear that. It's a, just a perfect, perfect storm, even without COVID-19. It sounds like a yeah. huge challenge. What, yeah. what? I'd like to bring Ken in in one more minute. But what, um, what's the status now of the um, the pressure on the elders in terms of sort of religious fundamentalism, in terms of that that difficulty of sort of maintaining tradition? You know, you have the Ethiopian Orthodox Church been there for thousands of years, and more recent sort of evangelical Christian groups. That's, that was the concern 10 years ago. How is that, how is that conflict or, or not now playing out? You remember that we were trying to have a meeting of elders and leaders by bringing elders from these communities and then bringing government officers to discuss on such issues um, 10 years or so ago. Um, I think it showed the elders where to go but it didn't give them the power to move us to wherever they wanted. Um, the situation now after, during the last two years has improved a lot, improved a lot because the pressure on communities by religious uh, fundamentalists has, has, has been reduced. But it's something you have to guard carefully. If the public are guarding this, uh, otherwise people are ready to grab your rights, you know, and, and go and do what they like. 
So we are seeing there's, um, they asked me to talk about culture, religion, and the difference between religion, religion and culture for Muscal. Religion and culture for Muscal in Abaminch during the Muscal celebrations. And I clarified certain points saying like, religion is what you follow in the, the, you know, the Bible and the different rules and codes of behavior. But culture is where people, you, you really allow others to be what they are, including if you are a good Christian, you would allow others to follow their own, to practice their Judaism, their Islam, or their traditional religions. So um, I think the situation has improved a lot and people are asking to, they, the question when I was last there was give our traditions back gave us our traditions back. And this was a very strong kind of thing. And uh, I think under the prime minister, there has been quite a promising move. No one can bulldoze you right now coming to a village telling you, no, you are, your relation to the land is not right. And so on uh, a bit uh, would be embarrassing for people who would want to do the same mistake as that they have done in the past. And, um, in some places, they are going back to appoint their traditional governance uh, elders. And as you know, the traditional governance structures work in, in tandem with government institutions at, at the local level. So they are the backbone, actually, of governance, uh, of the state governance. And uh, they have been misunderstood in the past. And I think it's, there is a clear understanding of who they are. And some of the guys appointed are their own children. And uh, they, I think they understand the realities better uh, compared to their predecessors. And I hope and my, I pray they continue this same strong position with reference to cultural independence and independence of spiritual experience. Mm. Uh, that we are not, I think, uh, we should not be allowed to dictate our own things on others. And therefore, Gamo elders and the Gamo people also have the right to practice their religion and choose any religion they really like. And we cannot show them this is the right direction, but they must not be, uh, they must not be attacked for following their religion but they must also not be antagonized and uh, marginalized for that. Great. Well, I, hope that, I hope that continues to be true. And Ken, I'd love to bring you in. Um, I, I'd love to hear any comments you have about what Tadessa has already said, but I, I have a, a question for you. Ken is joining us, I think, at three in the morning under a full moon from Borneo. So thank you so much <laughs> for waking up in the middle of the night. And either that or you've been writing until three in the morning. But Ken, when you, when you came to the Christensen Fund, and I, I wanna say thank you again to both of you for your support of our, of our work, trying to help tell these stories. Um, you came with a, a vision that some form of collapse was inevitable for this industrial civilization and, and that the strategy that was important for the Christensen Fund was to support the stewards of biocultural diversity the, the communities that have maintained sacred sites and language and songs and ceremonies and food systems. And I wonder with some time now to reflect since you've, you've moved on with this earth changing moment we have in front of us right now, how, how you look back on that, that strategy and whether we actually are now seeing it playing out. Please, please say anything you wish at this point. <laughs> Thank you and, and good evening, everyone. And um, what a delight it is to be sitting here with the, the two of you and feeling from you, Tadessa, the, the beauty and power from the earth. And, and I congratulate the, the government. You know. Gamal people, and and also, uh, you know, in the con in this in this changing context in Ethiopia, I, I really congratulate Ethiopians for uh, finding a way through in which they can hear each other and hear the earth and um, and live live forward, live forward, and value for all of the knowledge and tradition that they that they have to find 
a good way to live forward in this very complicated world. Um, listening to you, I, I'm reminded of the situation, I think, of, of indigenous peoples uh, everywhere on the planet right now, which is that they have high vulnerability to COVID-19 because of all of the ways in which they are historically marginalized, um, including from health services. Um, but they also um, are having to tackle COVID-19 in the context of multiple other pressures and threats, the kind of climate uh, instability that you're describing in Gamma and other places. It's drought, and drought leading to forest fires for, for forest people in Ireland, for example. Um, it's in many places that they're, they're tackling or facing COVID in the face of other disease threats other disease threats also being all part of this global tumult and confusion that we are we are in right now, um, as well as all kinds of, you know, um, financial and political and economic threats. So they're they're having to, they're taking on COVID in this in these very difficult times. But um, for indigenous people, I think it, it's not just. The experience is not just one of victimhood. The energy and response, um, the resources that they draw on in the face of COVID, and sacred sites, um, the knowledge of elders, these, the practice, the practice of ritual. These are all of the things that are giving strength to Indigenous people at this time. I think the other thing that's happening is similar to the one that you just described, which is that uh, Indigenous people themselves with their organizations and networks and ability to um, deploy and com in combination Indigenous knowledge and contemporary social organization, contemporary knowledge of, of virology, of public health, finding those things in very powerful ways to come up with meaningful responses. Uh, that's happening too. Um, and um, coming to your question, Toby, I think that um, if there's something positive for humanity that will come out of this COVID experience, it's going to be, first of all, that a sense of just how connected we are globally. Um, with each other, but also that it's not possible um, with money and technology to separate ourselves from what's happening on the planet. Um, and I think also linked to that, a, the, the, a recognition, a greater recognition of our vulnerabilities. I think that um, for several decades, people have been encouraged to feel really rather invulnerable. Um, and that yes, you know, there were climate change and biodiversity, you know, we were going to be okay. Um, and these were nice things to, you know, you know, there were things you could worry about a bit, but we were going to be fine. I think if there's a positive thing about the, um, the fear, powerlessness, suffering that has it is you know is raining down on people is the awareness that it's not going to be uh, that um and um you know we were in a way at christensen we were optimistic pessimists we assumed that all of these difficult things were going to happen but we were optimists in the sense that we said that um you know uh gaia is bigger than all of those things and that insofar as we can align ourselves with, with Gaia, good things can be made to happen. Um, and perhaps that's what may happen now. Uh, certainly, I think that there will be renewed energy behind um, a range of things, the, the power of place, the importance of local, local economy, local energy, local food, being that we can't rely on this level of connectivity. We've got to be. Um, I think that the experience of, you know, half of humanity or whatever 
being constrained to their particular place, I think it's really alerted us to what is the quality of our place and what is our investment in the big tree to use did. Uh, what is our connection to which provided the cultural and, and spiritual and family value that we have? What is our connection? Where are, which is our place? And I think it's going to lead to um, a lot more energy um, among people to respond to that um, and to think about what are they investing in creating beauty, um, creating a sense of community and security in the very architecture, natural and physical architecture of, of, of our places. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we, we do have one question that has come in um, with about 20 minutes to go. I, I'd love to throw this question to you, Tadessa, and, and then Ken. How can religions such as Christianity and Islam coexist with spiritual practices directly rate, related and embedded within the land? Monotheism puts man above the land and does not give the land consciousness, whereas traditional land-based spirituality enlivens all in place. Monotheism always desensitizes and offends land-based practices. Tadessa, what are, what are your thoughts? Philosophically, I think that's what um, the monotheistic uh, things stand for. But in practical terms, when you come to indigenous places, uh, Ken might remember Obowensho. This is an indigenous religious sanctuary, spiritual sanctuary, not religious. So here are the Sidamo elders who, who are uh, custodians of their territory. They have uh, big forest land where at the middle of which they have their sanctuary. So uh, Christians and Muslims come and take shelter there. And when they come, they give the Christians separate room to the Muslims and every um, entity is um, given the autonomy to, to live and practice uh, their religion. They do not tell them to, to live like them. But again, look, the monotheistic religious followers come to an indigenous sacred land to pay their respect. They also look for very positive uh, things in their lives and come and want to share from the wisdom and blessing of these places. In some cases where the courts and others have failed to uh, execute their judgments, people come here to have their things, dis the decisions made for them by, uh, by um, indigenous religious uh, leaders. So maybe I'm, I'm not answering the question directly, but you can uh, tailor your religious things and tame them to the taste of the place and, and your own kind of interest. And have we, have we not bent rules to, to live with others? So uh, I think uh, the period requires, unless we are, um, religious fundamentalists or extremists, I think we tend to adapt our things to uh, live with others with respect and to have also self-respect as well as respect for others. So is that not living together? Is that not um, harmonizing with others? So I thought a was a was a good example for me uh, to, to learn from because this small indigenous center accommodates, you know, people from the, with, in Ethiopia, the Christian population is huge. And so also the Muslim population. But imagine their representatives coming and followers of those religions coming and, you know, surrendering to the authority of this um, smaller indigenous thing. So I think we have lived, um, in this way, we have monasteries in the middle of Gamo that were from the 13th or so century, and people respect them. Uh, Shagire went to the Christian church when there was celebration and would do what other people do, but come to his sacred site and do also what is customary obliged to do. So for him, any celebration was welcome because it was a sign of good life and also uh, community feeling. Uh, so it wasn't exclusive. 
of course, it doesn't mean there are no, I mean, there are not others who, who condemn such practices. And actually, there's much condemnation from uh, the powerful, uh, the leaders, especially of such religious uh, groups, that you uh, you surrender to um, paganic, they would call kind of practices. Ken, Ken, what have you seen in terms of a trend of mainstream faiths in relation to traditional spiritual practice from your perspective? I think that um, a kind of a, a very formal response to monotheism and um, uh, a kind of textual analysis of um, religions of the book, you know, does, you know, does tend to um, separate you from a relationship to land and to a more, more, more plural spiritual and cultural relationship. Yes, that happens. Um, but what's really struck me um, um, over the years is, in a way, the, the contrary, which is that um, the practice of these um, of these religions, particularly um, in places, very quickly becomes um, much more diverse and much more sensible over time. Uh, you know, over time, and in most in most cases, so that. Um, 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 practices of pilgrimage, um, uh, the maintenance of sacred sites. I mean, I was very, very struck um, in uh, in my experiences with with um, Rafiq Kashavji and and Urjan Hamadanova in Central Asia with um, with folks there. How um, they would recount in the experience of their sacred sites how you know up to five different world religions had encountered this sacred site and maybe at certain times tried to denounce it or control it, but ultimately had had come to respect it and come to be incorporated in one way or another um, in the in their practice. Hmm. Um, now this may or may not be the case for you know um, important male leaders of those. But in terms of the in terms of the religious practice of women, um, in terms of the religious practice of local communities, those sacred sites, for example, um, were very important places of communion, communion among peers of believers or practitioners, communion between them and the natural world. They were places of healing. They were places of dreams. They were places where people could meet on their own terms with each other and with nature and maybe spend three days together um, outside actually of the control of patriarchal and bureaucratized society, religious or otherwise. And those things are, are happening in the name of um, or Christianity or any other practice. So um, I say that not to say that we shouldn't be worried about fundamentalism. We should be very worried about fundamentalism. Um, because, of course, it's trying to insert it into that domain. Um, trying to, I mean, you know, the, in a certain way, the great insight of religions was the possibility of a more direct relationship of people. The irony was that that often led to bureaucratized and institutionalized practices severed that. Um, and, um, and these kind of eruptions now of, of, um, of fundamentalism, often the only way actually that they can be, um, that, they, that they can be responded to is through the, bo the body and the land, the very things that they fear most, particularly the feminized version body and, and sensuality. That's really can be the only way that people can have a, a cultural, a religious human experience that can help them to see um, the consequence of um, the poisonous consequence of fundamental. So mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's, I think how I would respond. And I would say that um, this site, Abawancho, that 
um, Tedesso is referencing close to the, the capital of the, of the southern region is an extraordinary example of a place where generations of elders have um, managed to simultaneously um, uh, deepen and demonstrate a vibrant relationship, spiritual relationship with the land and, and forest groves, at the same time as being a place not only that not only open to but inviting of all religions to come together and um, enable all religions to say that you know to respect creation. Um, and uh, because of that, um, it it is a sacred place. It's a, it becomes a place where you can create com uh, community, where you can uh, engage in peace. Process when there are disputes within people because everybody expects the same place. That, I've seen that happening and heard about that happening in many other parts of the world. Mm. Thank you. Tedessa, we have another question about um, the importance of elders and that I know um, Shagire and his wife passed away. I'm, I'm sorry to have learned that. Terenke, who we filmed with, a, a, an oracle, prophet, uh, healer. Um, the question has to do with the importance of elders in communities, that we're suffering a loss of elders and, and they're, they're vulnerable at this time. Uh, can you comment on the importance of, of elders in, in Gamo and in carrying on tradition and, and knowledge of traditional ecological and spiritual knowledge? Yeah, the mountain <clears throat> rangelands and um, pastoral areas uh, would be without any leadership if you don't have elders. You will have at least one or two of the elders spending their time to guide young children taking care of the animals. Young kids who have no idea of when sheep give, you know, when sheep, when it's lambing season, they will have to do it when once the elders teach them they they can manage the birth thing of the lambing season and even cows and so on and then what kinds of um feeds they have to which which kind of pastures they should uh, herd this part of the day and which 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 one i mean part of the year from season and which ones not to it's like imagine being an orphan from year seven if you don't have elders, the whole community becomes like orphans. You need, we do not have reference books. We do not have Google to answer our questions. We do not have anything. You just are blind. If you don't have someone who can uh, interpret your dreams, tell what to do when, tell you what to do when your barley goes, turns, the color turns yellow, or your insect gets funny, the ship gets wilted, the leaves get wilted, then you have to consult elders. The elders are the life of society. By elders, it's not, we do not mean very old people, aged and, you know, very difficult to walk, but people who know, that's the title, we call them chima, means people who know. Hmm. Elders, the English elders, the term is, I think, a little bit uh, confusing. Looks like a gerontocratic, gerontocratic kind of system. Of course, the older you are, you have much, um, much opportunity to, to have a say on issues because you know better than anybody else because you've experienced through for many life, for many years of your life, what's, what's going on. But so I think what I use the idiom of being orphan. I've been saying to my friends in Ethiopia that we've made ourselves or orphan by by not allowing our our elders to assemble in places and talk and discuss on our issues and find solutions we've prohibited them from assembling from letting them speak on matters that on things that matter for everybody so if you didn't allow your elders to speak for 30 years it means you've made them dumb dumb or numb so what this means is you've blocked the whole education system of a community. Things are not going the way they should go. And you've given, in some places, 
the young of 10 and 11 have been given autonomy. And imagine it, what a 10 year old will do in your own house if you don't keep your eyes on what they do. And so a whole, a whole land, say Gamoland, going that way is extremely, extremely lethal. And we, are suffer, we have suffered the consequence because we've not let our elders play the role of elders. We rather thought the priests can tell us the way forward. The priests only preach. They don't know how to cultivate. Mm. Yeah? And the school teachers know how to teach you for alphabet and how, the, how to read and write and how to do arithmetic, arithmetic. They don't plant the barley. They don't plant the insect. They don't, that's not their job. So we really became ignorant in a, in a short span of time. But thanks to you know, women and others who quietly taught without sitting in the assembly places, uh, I think we have survived, I, I feel. And now I think the younger generation, uh, the generation below mine understands what kind of disaster they have allowed to take place. And they realize uh, this cannot, they cannot afford to continue to do that. So there is in every place now a hunt for elders to tell this, to tell that. And when the conflict violence flared in Ethiopia, you know, it was like government was like a fire, fire engine. They were running here and there. And that time of madness um, proved the need for elders to those who know where did we have peace treaty with this group, with that group, and in which place. Which family, um, which family brought, um, you know, which family took responsibility in making peace pacts and so on. Now they had to make an inventory, you know, and check. And my only, ad my advice on some of the participants are in this meeting uh, now, and I've been advising, could we go village to village checking when the peace, a peace treaty between this community and that community expires. We have 55 in Gamo. And even the 55 had um, pacts, peace pacts and, and oaths in the sacred places, um, defined sacred places. And there were some clan chiefs or family heads that were responsible for this. So I suggested if you don't do this, if there's fire starting this place then the most peaceful place will be gone and would be joining the madness elsewhere. Mm. And uh, fortunately, I think there are in disguise many people who have not forgotten their elder role and uh, they have remained sane because of that. We have remained sane because of that. There's another question. Um, you know, we show in the film the Debusha and it's a, it's a gathering place for men. And so there's a question about the role of women in Gamo culture. Do women have a similar place to meet and assemble? And is, what, what, is the, what would you say is the role of women in the leadership in, in Gamo? I think we men are very powerful in Gamo. Um, they have been weakened by our mimicking Central Ethiopia. So the idea of masculinity moved in and everything, you know, being macho and telling women to stay aside, away and, and so on. But look, um, only uh, prior to 74, we in, um, in the Kogo area of um, Gamo brought a queen from uh, Northern Gamo, further north from us, from a wedlock she was chosen. And her husband is asked to so that she can reign in our territory. And this uh, queen that's brought in and a male kind of halaka chief would handle the knife, a sacrificial knife, the, the, the thing, the hand and, and slaughter together, sacrifice. And this I've not heard in any other place in Ethiopia where a man and a woman take charge of sacrifice or making an offer to in a sacred place. So she would be the ruler for the period of, um, for a given period and will be sent with respect and presence to her family home. And um, 
that was a blessing everybody believed because if Kashe isn't there, my one of my daughter's name is Kashe in commemoration of this. And so if women didn't take that kind of role, there was always a disaster to be expected because a halaka is never a halaka on his own. A halaka must have his wife, his official wife, to sit with him during the ceremony. Elizabeth was invited. I was told to bring Elizabeth when I was made a Huduga elder. I could not take that on my own. She had to be flown from here with me so that we took the, so that we can take the thing together. So the thing of complementarity is essential. You cannot do it on your own. But as I said, we had um, Lisha, the cow or the king, queen of Lisha, Zada, was a lady. The, and the queen of Zada, uh, Dita, was a lady too. I mean, these are two communities among the 55. So we, have, we had three or four queens. And this was after the uh, ninth, after, yeah, for, but for the last how many years, it's, it's the male taking over in every regard. And uh, so, um, but prayers even will not be effective without your wife being there and putting the kind of having the right setting for your spiritual practices at home and among the family and so on. Thank you. We're, we're getting close to the, the time limit here. So um, Ken, I just, you have some friends listening. I wonder if you could just tell us how you're doing in Borneo. You live looking at a sacred mountain. I've seen pictures, I haven't been there yet. But um, how has your life changed? How, how are you doing there? What, what, are you, what are you thinking about these days? Well, um, greetings to anybody I know out there um, and anyone I don't know. Um, Yes, I'm living on my wife Cynthia's uh, family land, um, on a on a ridge in the in the in the rainforest beneath this uh, fourteen thousand foot sacred mountain in Nabalu. Um, tonight it's under a full moon. It's extraordinarily beautiful. There's bodies of mist between us and the and the mountain. Um, these are alleys that were traditionally um, rice farmed for, for hundreds of years, uh, Dusun speaking people. Um, and um, now about half of those rice lands have been to you know, woods and other kinds of development. And uh, many of the rest of them are not farmed because of, you know, cheap rice here from other parts of Southeast Asia. Here we are in this um, epidemic, in this pandemic. Um, all of the long distance trade of East Asia has been thoroughly disrupted. Um, everyone's talking about the fact that Borneo produces only about a quarter of the rice that it eats. This is a rice culture. Uh, this isn't a rice culture only in the sense that people like to eat rice. It's a rice culture in. in almost all aspects of cultural and spiritual and life of rice. Um, and yet this is a society that relies three quarters of its rice from other countries. Um, so um, this is something that the government, um, right down to, you know, the, uh, the elders in the community, in the villages right here, are worrying about in the context that Vietnam has, um, supplies about 30, 40% of our, our rice here has said that they're not going to export. You know what's going to happen next. But that's the kind of thing I'm now involved in, um, you know, how to work with the communities here to, to revitalize their rice production. Of course, very complicated. Uh, we are, we're living in a very, very complicated world. Um, and um, we may be in Borneo, but um, um, all the very same forces are right here. Mm. Mm. Thanks. I love the butterflies on your pajamas. 
<laughs> One of my daughters gave me this. <laughs> Tedessa, do you have any last thoughts before we before we finish up? Yeah, I didn't finish about the Dubusha and me thing thing, which I didn't answer fully, I think. And um, yes, women have their meetings. Um, they attend the bushes. What's most important is a seven-year-old child can appeal to the pusher, uh, the scream at dusk, no, dawn, and at dusk, sorry, and tell of his problems and to which the, the busha would respond immediately the next day. And the woman can attend the busha. The seating arrangements are different. Women sit in one part of the busha while men on the other. They do not mix because that's a, a, a kind of a clear demarcation between men and women. But there is an important event which brings women to the top of you know everything. And it's um, a, a ritual called um, marae. Marae is a ceremony where women of the whole of Doko, for example, go from the village, from the near the market, the valley of the Gina River, to the top of the Milo mountain. They will all be dressed in white, have butter, and walk through the germinating barley fields. Mm. And the belief is that if they walk, on the barley whose, which they grew, which they helped germinate through the manure they've carried on their backs, the barley would thrive more. So no man is allowed on that day. So they'll go to the mountain top, drink lots of tajtala, which is um, borde, which they brew. And then if they find uh, any person on the way, any male person, uh, that would be the end of it. They'll beat, him, beat them to pieces beat them very badly. And so that's a kind of a day of women, but their, their power, fertility power, is celebrated so much by allowing them that kind of space. But also they have labor groups where they take the most important job of um, managing the manuring of fields, whereas the men plow. Mm. So it's again a division of complementary kind of role but major decisions they do discuss. And, but again, the influence from the center has been eroding the women's power over the years. Well, thank you. And um, we're a little bit past the hour, so I think we should probably wrap up. And I just wanna thank Tadessa, thank you so much for joining us and spending the hour with us and Ken for joining us from Borneo. It's been so great to see both of you. And I think we'll just, uh, anybody have a final thought or are we, are we good? I do want to say, uh, Toby, that, um, you know, we've known each other 20 years or something now. Um, you have a, a very, really, really unique and beautiful, um, I don't know what to say, characteristic trait to your, to your character for a filmmaker um, where you keep this connection to the place, the stories that you tell. Yeah. There must be, you know, there must be so much energy for a creative person to move on to the next project, um, the next film. And I'm sure you have that too. But what you have done um, with the Gamal and with all the other places that you've worked in that this film and in the other films you've done in earlier in your life is you have kept these connections. Um, they become a permanent thread in your life. And I think that's incredibly important and incredibly meaningful. And I just want to commend you for that. Well, thank you, Ken. That means a lot. And I, I, I really do feel that it's such an honor to you know, be trusted to help tell some of these stories with the collaborative team that it takes to tell them and that an indigenous people's connection and, and, and um, protection of culture and the sacred is the most inspiring story on the planet and it is the pathway to a future. So it's, it's, um, it's a really an honor and I, I, I thank you for your support, both of you over all these years and, and for everybody who's listening because um, it's all about the stories rippling outward and a little bit of education at a time. So 
thank you all for being here. We appreciate your questions and uh, may the conversation continue and, and our friendships and I hope everyone stays safe out there and stays healthy. Thank you. Thanks to Ken thank and you. thanks to Dessa. Cheers, Ken. I'm gonna go to sleep now. <laughs> okay. Bye everyone. Thank you so much. Let's thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Bye everyone. <laughs>